Uh, good evening. We are here. It's the uh, Lowell Public School School uh, Facilities Subcommittee. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you take the roll, please? Chair Pearson Doherty? Here. Mr. Rossi? Here. Mr. Lay? Here. Be present. Thank you. Uh, also in attendance is school committee member Stacy Thompson and uh, Dr. Jim Hall, our chief assistant superintendent, Rick Underwood, uh, district facilities manager. I'm not sure of titles, I apologize. So the first item on the agenda is to discuss the update on the STEM portables that will be um, going into the uh, Rogers STEM school. Thank you. So Chairperson Doherty, there is a written summary um, on page two of the packet, but Mr. Underwood's going to provide the latest um, updates that we've received this week. Thank you. So th this, is the pa this is what was in our packet this weekend, correct? Maybe take one from the... Uh, there it is now. Okay. So uh, I know we, we got a quick update a couple of weeks ago on this, but uh, right now, best case scenario is the STEM trailers modulus could be in place by the end of the fall. Uh, that could be slowed by the hiring of the OPM, which we talked about at the last meeting. Uh, that uh, bid opens up tomorrow. So depending on what we hear from them, supply chains, they their concerns, their, you know, the, the, the overall design of the phase. It could be a little bit slow on that. We'll have more information in a better timeline and cost uh, as soon as that uh, vetting of the applicants uh, opens up tomorrow. So, just to be sure, the RFP is tomorrow? Yes, yep, it closes for tomorrow. I, I just have a question in terms of what's OPM? Owner's property manager. So procurement laws require over a certain value that we hire a uh, property uh, manager. And because of the cost of this and the, the, the modules combined together, it, it just hits that threshold. So that's the cause. So is this someone who comes in on a contract basis, a project manager, just to manage the installation of the portables? Yes, they'll write the scope. Um, of the work, they'll, they'll discuss with us our needs, what, what, we're, what we're looking for. They'll write a scope for that, uh, and then we'll vet that out to another set of contractors or, or an RFP for request for proposals for the actual modulars themselves. Um, and then there'll be the installation of the modulars, and then there'll be the tying in of all the um, fire suppression, et cetera. Now, one thing to mention is this could be speeded up too after we discuss with them our needs and, and which direction we want to go, whether we attach those modules to the building, which require fire suppression and, and those type of things, or if we keep them uh, away from the building but in close proximity. So certain things like that can speed up the process. Uh, but again, in a perfect scenario, we could have them in place by fall. The end and of fall. So I want to make sure, so the, the bids that are going to be open tomorrow are for the OPM. Correct. The project it's for manager. the manager. Yep. And what do we do like in other uh, portables, like when we had it at the daily, for instance, those were there for a long time. Were they separate from the building? I thought they were in the back. They, they were, oh, I'm not familiar with the daily. I mean, you're going back 15, 20 years ago. I'm more familiar with the Sullivan schools where I worked. The Sullivan schools were connected. Um, but again, I, I don't know how that process went. Um, I was not involved in that at all. I don't know if anybody else had a question regarding the STEM portables. Mr. I, Lay? Thank you, uh, Ms., uh, Madam Chair. I have a question on the, so, so the portable will not be available until late fall anyway. So we're not gonna be able to have it prior to school opening. So uh, the problem will s still uh, exist at the beginning of the school opening. So um, I am wondering if, uh, we have any alternative uh, beside portables? Can we make some more space, for example, or can we uh, do some arrangement? Yeah. So the facilities department is working closely with the school administration, the district administration, to develop a contingency plan uh, that may involve using space right inside that thing. 
a couple of scenarios. And again, this all has to be vented through the, the school committee, the subcommittee, the, the administration. But there's there's lots of different possibilities that we could we think of. One could be if we exclude the kindergarten in that one particular school, so that you're still getting a school of choice, but you would not start that first year in kindergarten. That would free up four classrooms there. Uh, and then what we could also do is there's a couple of large classrooms within that building that we could um, split into what we believe is another four classrooms. Um, so that would give us the total of eight. It does not uh, address the bath needs for bathrooms, uh, which is one of the big concerns when we're first looking at you know adding more students and, and staff to there. But uh, that would give us the breakout space. One thing to note while I'm talking about bathrooms too is when you're talking apples to apples and oranges to oranges, where there may be the same amount of bathrooms in the STEM Academy is, is, is as in some of the smaller populated schools, but they're totally different. It, for instance, the Sullivan School, the Wayne School, they may have a bathroom or a girls' room that have two stalls in, in, in a urine or four stalls, whereas the STEM Academy was, was a much older school. They have you know six and seven stalls um, in urinals in the bathroom. So although there's, the, you'll hear somebody say, well, we don't have you know as many, we have the same bathrooms uh, count as we do at the Wang and the Sullivan and so and so, but in fact, you know you have a lot more um, you, you, fixtures. So we'll look at fixtures compared to bathrooms, um, and, and there's a great number at the STEM than there are at the other schools. Yeah. Still Rossi. So I have a couple of questions. So, what is there still preschool at the STEM Academy, pre-K? Um, Robin, is there pre-K there? I, I didn't think so. It's K, K, K through eight. K through eight. Okay. And then, so the STEM was originally created as a middle school, right? Like the Wang of the Sullivan, right? Not believe, so I, much for a K through eight school, right? To be honest with you, I'm not sure what it was originally designed for. I mean, when you look at even going back to the, like the Bartlett School was a K through nine when it was first, you know, first designed. So I don't want to you know, cloud it with misinformation. Is it in its original design? I'm unsure. It may have been like the Daily, the Bartlett, back in the, you know, the early 60s, where it was kindergarten through ninth grade. At one time, high school was only uh, 10, 11, and 12, so. And my, just, I guess my other question is, you said best case scenario with the portables right. is the fall. That is correct. Late fall. Late That's fall. the best case scenario. That's everything works good. They come in, they say there's no pro but. I mean, we, we should be prepared to make the contingency plan, and that's exactly why we built that in. I mean, we know how things work. We have, um, we, everything could work well on one end, and they may say, you know, the availability is not there for the trailers or the, um, you know, the delivery time. So there's, 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 there's several different things that could slow that process down. Is there currently con like construction and like knocking down walls right now going on at the STEM, or is that planned no. to happen? No. No, right now there's nothing going on at the STEM. We, we have a contingency plan that, like again, it has to be vetted through all the, the, the proper channels, yourselves included, um, till we get that, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Lay. Thank you. I just want to say, Mr. Underwood, that um, I re I'm really pleased to know that uh, you, you are working on the alternative way to, uh, to ease the, uh, the trouble, the problem that we have at the STEM. So maybe my visual thinking is that uh, perhaps uh, we may not need to buy the portable after all if, uh, if uh, we find a solution to that, but uh, I'm There is a possibility. I mean, we, we actually vetted quite a few possibilities there. One of the things we looked at is, you know, could we wait, for, could we make this contingent plan and wait for the uh, STEM Academy to open, uh, open up? But you can remember that's not open until to, to, uh, 2026 when the high school is completely finished. I mean, that's one space. We also looked at the, and you know, there was a lot of kicking around about the St. Louis um, property. Uh, what we found out after all this, you know, is it, could we, should we, it's under agreement. There's already been a deal done there. There is some um, planning board um, and building department and variances that they have to go through. But as of right now, um, unless something happens in that project, that's not available to us right now. We have made it clear. Uh, or we have made it known that if something falls through there, uh, we, that we may be interested in looking at that. Uh, and again, that would be something that would be, you know, quite costly, and we'd have to, you know, come back to this council and, and, and determine what we're doing. But, you know, and the other thing is, what we want to do 
and what we what we should do. So I mean, it, we all want to build a new school, but if you go to the MSBA, they're going to want to know exactly what you do. What are other other contingency plans? Are there other options? You know. And they're going to want to know all that before they say, yeah, let's go ahead and build a new school. Because I think everybody in this room would love to say, let's buy the St. Louis or let's buy something and build a new element, uh, middle school in Senable. But again, that's four or five years down the line with design and, and funding and all that. So even that, you know, you're talking five years. Uh, unfortunately, we were talking about the Lewis School for a while. It didn't really gain any traction. I know Mr. Dakota brought it up. Yeah. many times across a couple of mayors and we just didn't get anywhere with it but We're Ms. Thompson. A little late getting to the game. Yes. Correct. Thank you Chairwoman Doherty. Um, I guess my question is well first of all I'm glad that there are many contingencies because I think we have a moral obligation to these students not to be sitting in a hallway um, in September. So I'm just curious what is our for lack of uh, you know better better terms what is our drop dead date on moving forward with the contingency to make sure, to ensure that our ELL students, our, our students are not in the hallways um, at the STEM Academy this September, this August. Unfortunately, um, I'd love to be able to give you a drop dead date, but until we really uh, open up that bid and have a conversation in the next couple of weeks with the OPM and, and, and get a better understanding of um, what they think, I, I don't really want to give a drop dead date without that information, if, if that's okay. But clearly we have to move quickly because we are behind the eight ball now. We've had a situation that the last year should not have happened. So I agree with you. Uh, I'm going to move quickly because we have a, m a number of other items. Um, number two, the address the ventilation and cooling issues for the summer. So Presently, we do not, the Lowell School Department does not have any large scale plans for air conditioning or ventilation at this time uh, in any of our schools for the, for the summer programs. Um, what we are doing is we're working closely now with the new administration on the DPW side, uh, Mark Byrne, uh, to find ways of fixing the equipment that we have right now. Um, many of the, the schools that are having problems um, have air conditioning there. It, we need to figure out how, you know, how we're going to find it and how we're doing. And I, and I think the addition to Mark Burns on the DPW side has been a, is a great help to us. He's uh, very enthusiastic and uh, working diligently to uh, come up with solutions to uh, many of these problems. So uh, that answers your question. Can I ask you, what is the status of the HVAC study? Because I believe it was this facility subcommittee that met earlier in the year and said, let's move forward with this because it's going to identify what our high priority areas and problems are. Do you know what the status of that study is? I do not is? know the exact status of, of that right now. I know it was, uh, I believe it's out for proposals. I don't, I'm not sure when it closes, but, but I'm not absolutely positive on that either. So this is not meant to you, Mr. Underwood, but we knew summer was coming. Yeah. Just like in the winter when we have to close school because they don't have heat. Um, so we don't, we really don't know the status of the study and we don't have a plan for ventilation and cooling for summer school, even though I think we're going to have summer school at every school, correct? Well, it's not we don't. I guess we, we don't have a, a, a plan per se, this is broken and this is how we're going to fix it. I guess the plan right now is to continue to, to uh, look more closely at this with the new team that we have. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we are doing, though, is we're bringing in an outside contractor. We've had great luck at the Stockalosa, the Bartlett School, and the Butler School through the Green Communities Act, uh, and that's a company called Logic. Uh, one of the good things about that company is we're able, or that, that whole process is, is if we can determine that it's an energy efficiency program where it's going to save money on energy, that we can circumvent the, the process of bidding out and we can spend $100,000 on each building um, per energy improvement measure. Um, so that alone saves a ton of time compared to having to just what we're doing right now, bid things out, uh, go to the process, advertise it, get biddings, get contracts, whatnot. This is a, um, in my opinion, a very stand-up company. We had great results at the Stockalosa and the um, Maury School. Uh, so, we're, and that information just came to us just recently on um, being able to do that program, you know, that the expenditure, 
of $100,000 per building per uh, energy efficient measure. So that is one of the plans that we're looking at. That's something else that the city is, uh, is helping us with. Uh, so I, I do think, you know, although I don't have anything in, in stone, I, I think we'll make some, some great progress over the summer. And speaking of, and I, I don't know if anybody else has concerns about the, the ventilation cooling for the summer, but I do have one more question on that issue. We had the high school students here for the advisory. They meet with us um, periodically, and they were talking about classrooms at the high school. We've already had some days that were like brutally hot in May, right? And they were talking about a room, one on the upper floors, that had no windows. Um, I'm just wondering, have you been in, involved with the facilities team at the high school? And what is the plan, even for the rest of this school year, never mind for the summer, where I'm thinking the population is going to be a lot less. We can prioritize, like we did during COVID, uh, that you're only in rooms with windows that work and have screens and you have fans. So. I don't know if you could speak to the student concerns they address to us. We have, and um, it's it's a isolated area within the 1980s building. I would say I say it's the center classrooms in in there that you're right. They don't have any windows inside. The air conditioning is not working in there. What we're hoping in in I won't say hoping. What we know is going to happen in the next couple of weeks is once school school starts, the gym facility comes online. The uh, part of the 1980s building starts to come down. Some of the, the rooftop units that are coming down, the parts will be scavenged to hopefully repair some of the, the other ones. I think if I remember correctly, we have six rooftop units that should be compatible with a lot of the other ones. And then the other thing is uh, once this comes online, uh, once this, the new gym comes online, Suffolk and their construction team now owns the 1980s building. So they'll be the people that will uh, we'll be able to go to and hopefully get answers for in fixing that building. So I think with the start of next school year, um, and hopefully sooner, that Suffolk and their HVAC technicians and whatnot will now be taking over the 1980s building uh, for all of the all of the controls, all of the uh, rooftop units, you know, everything. So doesn't answer your question for what we're doing for summer. We're still looking at that. You know, we're hoping we'll get some answers for those. But that's the long-term plan for next year. And, and, you know, in September, we still get a lot of hot days, um, right, especially late year, right up until October. So um, that's what we got planned for the high school. Any other questions regarding summer plans with heating and cooling? Or can we move to the next agenda item? Okay. So the next item is the furniture locker priority needs and the cost and plans to address them. Okay. So. When we knew this was coming up from, from watching the school committee, we went to all the buildings um, and we looked at all of the things that we thought, and we talked about that the last meeting, all the things that we thought were eyesores to the building, low cost repairs that could be fixed, including furniture and, and lockers. Um, one of the things that came up, and, and we were talking, one of the companies, it, the biggest player in the game is a company called Solis. They work, they fix lockers and pots and mechanics all across the street, all across the state. We've had them in the last, uh, I think, a month and a half ago to look at some of our schools and to get an idea of what we need for parts and repairs to them. And when we walked them through the high school, the, the first thing they said is these lockers are in great shape. You have 3,000 lockers, um, or 2,000 lockers that are in great shape. And in their opinion, there's a lot of money there. And uh, we plan on repurposing those in at least some of the schools uh, or, or some of the biggest needs. Um, and then we also plan over the summer to deep dig, dig a little bit deeper into cost and uh, funding for the ones that we cannot repair. So. What about, um, I know you mentioned that you didn't have a lot of safety issues related to student desks, chairs, and tables, but I know we've got problem cafeteria tables. I we, saw them. We I mean, broken metal with a piece of tape over it, that's a, sa a safety issue. Um, and I know you've identified the cost of replacing tables. This is for the Bartlett School. Um, are we going to be ordering those? Like the Bartlett Schools are definitely getting replaced. Uh, in the last year and a half, we have replaced the Sullivan Schools and the Robinson Schools. Um, the Sullivan School was paid through uh, the revolving funds through Aramac. Uh, we intended to use that same funding source for the rest of them too, because they are a um, 
cafeteria supply product, so it meets right into those guidelines that we can use that evolving money, that account, I should say. So have they been ordered for the Bartlett? The Bartlett schools, we're waiting for a quote for them right now. They, okay. We should have it. We should have had it last week. Uh, okay. We have, we have an idea of what it's going to cost, though. There are, there's, if I remember correctly, without looking at the paper, there's 12, 12 seat tables at a cost of $1,700 a piece. So, the so you're talking about twenty, about $27,000 roughly per school. Um, that the and is the plan to have those in for the September? Yes. Yep. That's good news. The Bartlett schools will definitely be in, in place for the summer. I mean, for the start of school. And then repurposing the high school lockers, what is the timeline? Because I'm all in favor of that. Yep. But what is the timeline for doing that? They're going to start coming down. A good portion of them are coming down in the 1980s um, as soon as school ends this year. Excellent. Yeah, so we will start find. First, one of the first things we have to do is we have to find some place to house them until till we can take the other ones out. So we're looking for a place to, to fit them. But June 21st, the last day of school, the 1980s building and, and a good portion of that um, field house, all of the field house and a good portion of the 1980s comes down. And in terms of where have you highlighted, I mean, I saw ones at the Bartlett that were deplorable, so have you highlighted what schools most need locker replacements because we could start to take them down while they're taking the ones down at the high school, and, right? So, we can. So many of the elementary schools, um, they don't have lockers, so it's really the middle schools. And, and um, so we've got eight middle schools. Um, the Sullivan, like I said, the Sullivan and Robinson have already been replaced. Um, I know the Wang and the Bartlett School are probably the, the next two that we'll absolutely be looking at to replace those. Um, and then we'll go, so that'll leave four that will be in the mix to determine which ones will come next. Does that seem like something that could happen before the start of school in the fall? Absolutely. I, I guess I just have a general sense you want, and I think you said it in your report, we want our students and our staff to feel they come to a school that's kept up, in good condition, mm -hmm. take pride in their environment, and I, I think that part of it is on us. Yeah. The desks, the lockers, um, so thank you. We, we, have, we have purchased hundreds of desks in the last four years though too, just so you know. I mean, we haven't done full schools, but I, I would say close to probably three to 400 desks and chairs have been purchased in the last four years to replace old and aging ones. There was a large purchase done at the, uh, at, at the STEM Academy, the Bartlett School. Um, I'm trying to think who else got next. Um, I forget, but I can get you a list of the ones that we've bought so far. Same thing, we, I think we've bought at least 15, 20 teachers' desks also. And a lot of those, a lot of those requests don't come from, it, right now they're coming from, the, they usually come from the, from the schools themselves. They'll say, hey, we need the, you know, this. And, and they also have a certain amount of funding in their own budget. They replace certain things. They're not large-scale replacement things, but, you know, tables and chairs and stuff like that on small scales. So now we're looking at what can we do to, you know, do a larger-scale funding source. Thank you. And um, any other, any comments or questions about the furniture needs in the buildings? Um, so the last item is top. HVAC concerns that should be addressed before school starts and I don't know if you have in the fall I know we had talked about we know what the major things are we don't have to wait right. for this um, report yeah. we have rooftop unit at the B Butler school we have the chiller at the Merklin school we have um, the chiller at the Butler School. We have a heating unit for the gymnasium in the, in the Butler School. We have air conditioning in uh, rooftop units at the Wang and Sullivan that are all need to be looked at. It never worked, right? Those rooftop yeah, units were never connected. Yeah. So I'm wondering, we, this, our facility subcommittee is going to be meeting with the council. They'll be scheduling something. And I would really like to be able to bring this before the city. These are our priority HVAC concerns. We know we've got citywide issues. But without having to wait for this assessment, if we could get that, I think that would be very helpful. And I would be open to that in the form of a motion. Yes, I will motion that we have a report of, oh, if I could make a motion to have a report of the top HVAC concerns 
in our school buildings um, so that we can bring it before the City Council for our joint facilities meeting so we can all be on the same page. Um, I think it's important. So motion, motion by Mr. Rossi, seconded by I Mr. Second Lay. It. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then I noticed you provided us with a list by school. Um, and some of the things were small and some were, you know, but I think this would also be helpful. It's tiny, tiny print there. No, I, I apologize for that. No, that's fine. You wanted to fit it all and save some trees. I get that. But I wanted to ask you specifically about the number of places where you mention windows. Like, let's say the Cardinal O'Connell. Windows need replacement. How many windows have to be replaced? Because I know we talked about this as part of the ESSER spending right. a while ago, last year, I want to say. Oh. We said we need ventilation, we need screens, we need shades, we need. So I, I'm seeing across this report, I'm pulling out how many windows need to be repaired at the Green Alge, broken glass at the Laura Lee. Uh, there's a lot of stair issues too that yeah. I think are important. So, so this was list, this list was made up of. So what happened was I sent Al, Al Al Luna really spent a lot of time visiting the schools and I said Al I want you to do me a favor walk into the school start right at the front door I said just walk right through the whole thing we're not looking for big item big ticket dollars I said I want I want to understand the things that are going to make a big impact on visual sight when a parent a student a staff member a visitor comes walking into our schools so. That list was made up of real things. I mean, it's not going to, you may see something different, or somebody else may see something different when they walk through the school. But this was a first glance, go in, look at things. And what we want to do is we want to identify the things that we thought we could fix inexpensively and in house. So. But to that point, Mr. Underwood, right. we had asked for this to be done. So, how many windows still need to be repaired and replaced? How many windows don't have screens or don't have shades? Because this is going to directly impact summer school. Now, go to you. Let him answer that. So, there's, there's, there I was mean, two did different. We, sorry, did we do some and this is what's left? Or? We did. We, we had allocated, there was, a, there was a request several, I mean, what, a year ago for $200,000 for windows and screens across the district. Out of that $200,000, only $36,000 was end up being spent on, on windows. But there was a list put together of all the windows that were broken, all the, all the ones that needed to be repaired. Um, it just has not been um, made it into a purchase order yet. Why? I'm not sure of that. I mean, it, I, it, I, I believe we, it was we, the will we, of we this a, committee. We put a lot of, I mean, you gotta remember, we went through a, a period where we put forward a $1.6 million priorities list. And out of that, I think, you know, $800,000 got spent. We ran out of time. It was recaptured. It was repurposed. Then we came back with a $3.2 million prioritized list. Um, and they, you know, a lot of that stuff did not get, you know, it just hasn't been, it had, didn't get funded yet. I'm not sure why or how it got diverted. Uh, and then we put a $14.5 million or actually, I think it started off at 15.5, and you know, it was, yeah, go ahead, let's get it done. I mean, some things just didn't get funded. I'm not sure if they didn't get funded. Or I, I mean, I believe it was the will of the committee to do. I can remember a first grade teacher saying to me, if I just had a shade I could pull down and a screen, because her, her class faced, faced the south, and you had kids melting with that sun coming in. And that was way back that we asked and we said we wanted to do that. This is the stuff that needs to happen for summer school and should have happened last year. Ms. Thompson? So I want to thank you for this list. I looked through it, and it, it's okay that it was small print. <laughs> I looked at it really close. <laughs> um, but I did have a serious concern as I looked at this list because, you know, 12 of these schools had safety issues with entry points. Um, and as we know, with the, you know, looking at Uvalde, um, Texas, that really it struck me. Um, doors rotting, doors falling off hinges, and there were 12 schools at, when I looked through this list that fell into that. So I'm just wondering um, specifically about the entry point work. Um, how quickly can we get that done? I don't think this is something that we can wait on. We are working on doors right now, um, as you know. It, 
we all watched the news what happened recently and, and unfortunately those are the things that bring these things to the forefront um, so we brought in um, DPW uh, has, has been actively working on on all the extra so we sent out an email we said not interior doors what doors are not working don't close can they be pulled open do they get stuck in there so I think we identified I don't know 15 20 doors across the city um, we have the ones that we knew we could not fix uh, we've sent out a company that have, we're waiting on a price to have those fixed, low high school doors, uh, McAuliffe doors. There was two doors that McAuliffe's been an ongoing process. And many of these doors were not neglected. What they are is they, they get fixed and then re-break. So you'll get vertical rods on a door where you push the crash bar and the two vertical rods will, will come in. And what ends up happening is over time, you know, they get pushed in, they get pushed, and they start to drag on the threshold. So you come in, you repair it, and it works, and they leave. Um, and no fault to theirs, it's just, it's just the nature of the game. Those vertical rods are always, always a problem. So over time, it catches on that threshold and it doesn't close again. We go back and repurpose it. So now we've done so many minor, uh, I would say, repairs that we had to go back at. We've now brought in an outside company, New England Door and Finish, um, to look at some of the, the reoccurring problems to, to, to fund them new. So we're waiting on prices now. It's specifically, low high school doors um, in the McAuliffe doors are two of the big issues. Thank you. I see. All set, Ms. Thompson. Every door closes right now. I mean, that, that could change tomorrow. You know, with with. You know. But that, there's also a lot of stair issues. I, I know you noticed. I don't know if you noticed that, Ms. Del Rossi. I just wanted to ask. In terms of Lowell High School, there was nothing listed, and I know those stairs when you walk in the 1980 building have been a huge issue because they, you can't even access those doors because no, no student can because it's all like crushed in. And I know there's been lots of issues in regards to that. And the second uh, part of my question is in terms of I, I believe you brought this up the last facilities meeting or two that there could be a premier SR funding that you can pay employees to maybe work overtime and address some of these issues and how we could how we could utilize those funds to fix some of these issues because they're major issues that don't take a lot of time that could be fixed yeah the the high low high schools had door issues especially interior door issues for as long as I've been here. I know the, the fire department complains about it every year as part of their occupancy permits. Um, they, they did put a large scale um, project together and got uh, quotes and funding maybe three years ago pre-COVID. Um, the cost was, it was, was huge. It, it never got done on the city side. Um, so lots of doors, you, you are correct. Uh, it's, it's a never ending issue at the at the high school you have thousands and thousands of doors i know that's not what you want to hear but um we, we we try to address them the best we can dpw have carpenters there you know constantly fixing doors just my other question part of the question and part of the premier sr funding that was mentioned that could be used to pay for some of these fixes with overtime or whatsoever so could you explain how that would work so it was just an idea on on on, on that I had thrown out there because I knew they said that it when during that joint subcommittee meeting they said you could use it for premium pay so that's what I brought that up that day you know if they if there was that I have not read on what they meant by premium pay but if there if it was something they could use and it was something I was throwing out more to them on the city side uh, not so much for the, the school funding we um, we have that $14.2 million uh, ESSER uh, funding prioritized list that you guys all looked at, is, is um, voted on it. That is our ESSER money right there. So out of that ESSER money, I think we have left $697,000 and some change um, that we can use for other projects. But everything out of our ESSER money is listed in the packet that you got two weeks ago. That, um, right. We haven't actually gone over that list as a committee recently. Um, I know there's um, some, the STEM portables took a big chunk of that money out. Yep. So I wanted to ask, how, are, how do we replace windows and doors? Do we need to wait for city employees to do that? Could we hire a contractor to come in and get these windows done for summer school? Yeah. So as you know, everything that has to do with the building is, is done by the city. We pitch in the best we can, when we can, and for you know, lots of different things. Um, 
So when a window breaks, you know, at any of our schools, whether it be a door or an outside, we call DPW, they'll come in, they'll board it up, and they make the repairs. Um, the repairs over the many, many years have been, you know, budgetary issues where they'll come in and replace it with plexiglass or they'll, they'll you know, they'll replace it with, and it's a quick fix and they never get back, you know, we, it's not they don't get back, they're off doing something else, they're running for the next emergency. So now we have, you know, plexiglass at, at you know, lots of our schools, it's very unsightly. Um, we have boarded up windows that, you know, need to be addressed. Um, but it's, it's costly, you know, glass, glass and glazing right now is, a, is at a premium, uh, if you can get it. it. It's one of those things now that just like everything else in COVID, it's a supply and demand, um, you know, product. So. Um, um, I thank you for this information. I would just reemphasize we are meeting with the city. I'd like to have this documentation to present to the city and hopefully working together, come up with a plan, okay. a plan that's going to be implemented soon. Well, I don't know if Mr. Lay had anything else. You had your hand up, but we are at 628. Okay. If I could so, have one more half a second. Half okay, a go ahead. When you're talking to the city council, I think it's important to, to, to let them know or remind them, I should say, that a best school system in the city, in the state, is an economic development. It brings people in. It brings money into the city. It's not just what we're doing for our kids. It's about economic development. We've been struggling for years to bring more funds into the city. You have the best school system or one of the best school systems in the state. People will come here. They will come here. They will move. That is funds to the city. And I think it's important for the city council and the, and the new city manager to understand that. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Lay? Actually, I do have questions, but we can, I can hold off to motion that. Motion to adjourn? I have motion to adjourn, sure. By Mr. Lay, seconded by Ms. Del Rossi. All those in favor, say aye. Thank you. Aye.